Hey everybody, my daily updates channel is where I post more casual day-to-day -day content, and in it I answer specific questions from viewers directly in the comments. I also do stuff like live sales calls, lead gen, and more. I had somebody ask me a particularly interesting question the other day about Luma Reach strategy specifically, so in this video I wanted to answer that question once and for all. Loom Video Outreach, when it's done right, is probably one of the highest converting outreach methods that you guys could use. But when it's done wrong, it's also basically just spam that wastes everybody's time, including yours. So my goal here is to break down the exact blueprint that I use and that I see other people using to crush it consistently. I'm going to show you how to structure these videos to actually get responses, because from what I could see, a lot of people are kind of missing the whole point with the Loom videos. And after that, we're also going to hit a few other common roadblocks that I see people stumbling into when they're building their automation businesses that I think will help the largest number of people right now. As always, if you guys have any questions, Questions your own that aren't covered today, I do personally read and respond to every comment on my daily updates channel. You can find a link to that directly in the description. Thanks for the unbelievable amount of value you drop every day for us. I have a question regarding the current custom Loom outreach strategy. Do you have a blueprint or system for the structure of the Loom video? Thanks a lot in advance. Here's like a good Loom SOP, okay? For anybody that's watching, start on the resource. So start on the right page. So for example, if this was the Loom and I was trying to roast, I don't know, my own LinkedIn or something, I would actually go to the resource that I'm doing the roasting in, okay? Something like this. It's important that you start with this because the first frame of the Loom video, if there's any sort of like embedding or whatever, the first frame of the Loom video will be their profile and they'll think that you are currently on their profile, which helps. Like imagine if you instead just did some cover page, like you know how Loom gives you a cover page or some new tab page or something. It's not evidently clear that this is not a templated video. So just make sure you're on their profile and you know, do stuff like a quick little zoom in the first few seconds. So be like, yo Nick, man, just came across X, Y, and Z. You know, quick little zoom. That way in the GIF, they see the zoom. It makes it abundantly clear that like this is not a templated video. And now you've just checked that box that it's not spam, okay? So start on the page. Talk about them to start. The first like 15 seconds or so is basically the most crucial part where you can position the rest of the video as providing value to them, not just being a sales pitch. So talk about them in the first 15 or 30 seconds or so. When you drop social proof, do it organically. So what I mean by this is don't just say, Hey, Nick, just landed on your LinkedIn. By the way, I do X, Y, and Z, and I've made a million bajillion dollars for creators like blank and other people like blank and blah, 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 right? Because that's not positioning the video to be valuable to me. When you talk about them, I always like doing something like, hey, I noticed really, really small thing that I can fix for you to make you, I think, 10, maybe $15,000 more per month. But you can let me know your thoughts on that if you find this interesting. It has to do with X, Y, and Z. And I'm actually going to show you everything you need in this video. So you can just like hand it off to your team. I really like you and I love what you're doing. And I really respect whatever your company name is. So just want to let you know up front, I'm not expecting you to work with me. Just thought if I were in your shoes, I would want somebody to tell me or something like that. I like that frame a lot. So I don't know, maybe you could call, <laughs> I'm sure somebody would call that the super cool loom blueprint that makes you a million bajillion dollars. But for me, that just seems pretty obvious, right? Like you just want to make it seem like you've uncovered an opportunity that they're not looking at and that they haven't noticed and that's currently costing them money. And with one tiny little fix, they can fix that opportunity and then start making the money. And you also want to make it seem like you're not the one that is forcing them to work with you for that. You're just giving it to them. And if you approach it in this way, you'll find that most people are just going to choose to work with you anyway, because they're like, well, this guy's just full of value. He's, kind of, he's sweating value. Of course, I'm going to work with him. He's the one that pointed it out. And then drop your social proof organically, like while you're explaining. Don't drop your social proof at the beginning in that big chunk like I talked about. And then um, for your CTA, I don't like to do like a, all you need to do is sign up for a call or, or whatever, because, you know, a lot of the time if you're pitching to larger people, these people are pretty busy. They don't really have the time to jump on a call for service implementations for every little thing. So instead, just say, hey, obviously I can take care of this for you completely end to end. I do this thing professionally. As I mentioned, I've done this for XYZ really big name, XYZ really big name. If you want me to do that, man, just like respond with a thumbs up. I will literally go through everything, build you out the full action plan, build out all the templates, and then just give them to you for free. And then if you like that sort of thing, maybe you and I can discuss working together in a larger capacity later. But yeah, I know giving value is how you get ahead in this industry. So um, just give me a shout and I'm more than happy to sort that out for you. That's the vibe that you want to give people with the CTA. You don't want to be like, book a call on my calendar. Okay. So this is how I do the Loom SOPs, basically. This is how the people that are crushing it with Looms tend to do it. And they're very mindful of the time of the person that they're reaching out to. Long story short, start on the page, talk about the person, make it seem like it's like an easy, simple fix. It's not going to take them any time to do and that you're giving them everything they need to pass off to somebody else within their team if necessary. 
when you do the solution or show them what the problem is, drop your social proof organically. Be like, you know, it's really interesting. I just did this for XYZ, a really big name, and we made them $43,000. Specifically, their big issue was this. And then you do it like while you're showing whatever you're trying to fix for them. And then we do the CTA. Again, just don't try and hard sell anybody, okay? Try and make it as low friction as humanly possible for them to get back to you. So it's like, yo, just drop me a thumbs up and I will literally do everything that I just told you I would do for free. I'll put it in you or your team's hands. And then only if you guys absolutely love it can we talk about maybe working together in the future. Dead Thunder 11 says, yo, Nick, thanks for this info. I'm wondering, do I need a team for my agency or can I run it solo? You can absolutely run it solo. I ran my agency solo for a very long time. Then I uh, ran my info product solo for a very long time as well. The limit that most people say you need to start hiring at is actually a lot higher than you think. And the benefit to not hiring right away, just so everybody's on the same page, is that let's say you're at 5,000 bucks a month and you start thinking, oh man, it's so hard to keep up with this stuff. I should hire somebody. One, the higher you're going to get at $5,000 a month is going to suck. You don't really have a very good budget to get good people. So odds are you're going to end up with some issues on that side of things. Either they're going to need to be trained or managed more than average, or their longevity is just a little bit lower, or I don't know, there's just some other issue with hires at that level, which is unfortunate. The likelihood of them working out is lower. Let's say you do end up hiring them and then two months go by and you train them up and everything is good. Now you're making $5,000 a month. You pay them $3,000 a month. Now you're making $2,000 a month. They're never going to be able to do the thing as good as you, which is just an unfortunate reality. And uh, your agency is going to grow slower because of it, because of, you know, poor retention, poor customer quality control and, and stuff like that. Okay, now contrast this with a totally different idea. Instead of you just running the exact same business model in universe B, you reach $5,000 a month and you think, hey, rather than hiring somebody, how can I shift the way that my business operates so that I can increase the total ceiling revenue attainable with just me? So I'll give you a quick example that a lot of people end up doing, myself included. Instead of selling custom builds, like most people do from zero to one, you start selling productized services instead. So instead of you having to go through a big scoping step and then learn potentially new software platforms and then do lengthy revisions and stuff like that, and you make $5,000 a month with it, a $5,000 a project with it, maybe you dial it back and you build a really simple deliverable and it's just like a CRM setup or something like that. And then it eliminates all those steps because you've already fixed most of those variables. Maybe the customer gives you some direction, but for the most part, it's you. And then instead of just doing one of those a month or something, now you can do five. And instead of charging $5,000, you're charging $2,000 because it's a smaller, simpler project. But two times five is 10, which is two times what you're making at $5,000. Do you kind of see my point here? I guess to make a long story short, Every time you're faced with this, like, holy shit, I don't really know if I can keep going fork in the road on your path, you sort of have two choices. And choice number one is higher and then continue doing the same business model, just slower. And then the other choice is, okay, think about how you could remake your business model to function at a higher level of leverage, which is what I've done what a lot of other people here do. And this is how freelancers and solo agencies are hitting, you know, 20, 30, and 40K months. Xander says, sup dog, love the regular effort, wanted to run something by you. So he's using something I used in one of my email campaigns. So I'm using cold email with dental clinics and creative agencies with nine inboxes at 270 emails a day. The reply rate is shit 2% and little to no positive reply. I've been copywriting for 1.5 years now. Copy-wise, everything's as solid as it can be. Offer guarantee, value, free leads, et cetera. Don't really know why this is happening. So what do you say? Should I ramp up to like 15 inboxes doing 500 emails a day or something else? I know it's hard to understand via YouTube comment, but would really appreciate if you could help. Thanks for the content, Nick. Yeah, no problem. Listen, man, I mean, like, first of all, you say I've been copywriting for 1.5 years now, meaning copy-wise, everything is solid. 1.5 years is very little in the grand scheme of things, right? Like, I've probably been doing copywriting for 10 years now, and I'd consider myself pretty good at it, but I wouldn't consider myself the best in the world or anything. So you're saying that everything's as solid as it can be. I don't really believe you. If the reply rate's shit and it's 2%, then obviously your copy is not. You're saying, oh, maybe it's the leads, maybe it's the deliverability, maybe it's something else. Dude, you can make any campaign have massive reply rates with the right copy. It's not about the audience. It's not about the leads. It's not about any of that stuff. Okay. Shit leads is like the number one excuse that people make because their performance isn't up to par. So I don't mean this just to put you on the spot and tell you that you suck or anything, but the copy is not as solid as it could be. Uh, copy is by definition, not as solid as it can be if your reply rate is 2%. Also a couple of other loaded assumptions here that reply rate is shit at 2%. I've scaled uh, many email campaigns at 2% reply rate. These are usually higher average order value email campaigns or they're email campaigns to people that are a little bit more enterprise where reply rates just tend to be lower. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can't make any money off of it. That's still one in 50 people responding to you. Uh, the thing that matters here is just what is the positive reply rate. If your positive reply rate here is, you know, 50 or 60 percent that's still one in 100 emails positive right so let's just say you send 10,000 well now you have 100 positive responses per day like is this really a shitty campaign no it's obviously an incredible campaign but if your positive reply rate as you were mentioning is uh, very very poor I don't know let's say it's like 
five percent or something then obviously this is one tenth of that meaning at ten thousand emails a day you'd only get 10 positive responses which you know is only going to convert i don't know between three to five calls maybe more i don't know i'm just like throwing some stuff at the wall given the fact that you're uh, reasonably new to this which ultimately is not really going to be anywhere near as worth it okay so just want to let you know right off the bat that the main issue here is your copy you may try and run from it you may try and escape it but destiny arrives <laughs> make me purple uh yeah main issue is the the copy and uh, you shouldn't just ramp up to 15 inboxes. You should learn why your copy isn't working. Maybe your copy is good, but it just doesn't work as well for the current industry that you're tackling, or maybe the current audience size or whatever. But you can either adjust your copy or you can try a different audience. But like you're trying right now to solve a problem that is very clearly copywriting related by just throwing more volume at it. And if your reply rate is nothing, or not reply, if your positive reply rate is nothing, this isn't going to help you. Okay, you got to fix the copy, man. And I say fix here in a loose term. It's not just about like having all of the bells and whistles and the boxes checked. This is real life, right? Like these are all rules and heuristics and approximations that we're trying to provide you to make you better at this stuff. But at the end of the day, these are just models. When you go into real life, things are always going to be a little bit different. So you're going to have to bend the rules, play with them a little bit, throw a bunch of shit at the wall, see what sticks. Then you're going to have to run it for quite a while. You're going to have to run it for, you know, at least uh, 1,500 emails, I would say, before being able to definitively say something is or is not working. Automation workflows, templates are commoditized. What's the next step? How much money have you made with automation workflow templates in the last 30 days, my man? What sort of uh, revenue are we talking? Whether or not something is commoditized doesn't really matter to you. If you're making like five or $10,000 a month, it doesn't matter. It doesn't stop you from being able to do that. You know what else are commodities, really? Barrels of oil. And uh, people make a lot of money off barrels of oil. So the whole idea that like they're commoditized, this is such a freaking, such a, such a buzzword. Most people don't even know what that means in relation to the economy. If something is commoditized, it doesn't mean that you can't make money out of it. So even assuming that these workflow templates or whatever were commoditized doesn't mean you can't make money out of it. Whether or not they're commoditized, a whole different story. But like, yeah, man, like, dude, the, I'll tell you where commoditization matters. Commoditization matters when you're trying to run a $10 million a year business or $20 million or $50 million or $100 million a year business, not a $10,000 a month business, you know? Like there's literally always room in a market for another $10,000 a month entrant. You don't have to worry about commoditization if you're just a freelancer trying to make a living. If you're trying to like build this huge Uber or whatever, yeah, you got to start worrying about stuff like that. But you're not, man. Like, let's be real here. We're just trying to earn a living. We're just trying to, you know, make significantly more money than the average person while working significantly fewer hours. So all this talk about commoditization and about like, oh, like the market saturation and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong. Markets get harder when they're saturated for sure. But the whole idea of like, oh, that means that we have to fundamentally change our approach to do X, Y, and Z is wild, man. You can just always just work a little faster, work a little bit harder, and you can get the same results, okay? And if you want to make $10,000 a month, you don't even really have to work that hard. So automation workflow templates commoditize. What's the next step? And then are workflow templates commoditized? Yeah, I'd say templates are pretty commoditized at this point, you know, just calling it what it is. But your value is not in your ability to generate templates. Your value is in your ability to build a solution for a client. I would never just sell a template. This whole business model, the leverage here is in the perception of white glove managed service. And I've said this from day one, it's all just about the white glove managed service. The perception that you do high quality work. Look at Design Joy, it's the same way that it works. This guy uses templates for everything. He makes over a million dollars a year as a solo agency owner with like 90 whatever percent margins. Honestly, uh, he's just like me. Look at that. He templates out everything. Are his templates commoditized? Yeah, but is he selling the templates? No, he's not selling the templates. He's selling you on like the client experience. He's selling you on like, you know, having your needs taken care of. He's selling you on peace of mind, he's selling you on all that. So you don't sell people on the freaking templates, guys. Because then you're no better than just like a, you know, little template GPT or something. Hey, Nick, I'm interested in the topic of selling project management systems for marketing creative agencies. I've been looking around YouTube for a while. I haven't found any clear templates or mindsets on YouTube yet about how to set up a system like this. And I'm struggling to understand what a project management automation system looks like since I have no experience in project management. I know this is a long shot, but can you tell me what info I need to ask the prospect of the meeting and explain how you typically build out or scope the system so that I'm clear on what I'm dealing with and the prospect is clear in terms of what they want? Yeah, so this is a great question. To dog food a little bit, which just means to pitch you on my own service, I do have templates for project management systems inside of Maker School spread out throughout month two, month three. I also have some resources between month four and month five. So if you did want to just jumpstart everything and just have templates that work out of the box, definitely check out Maker School. Do a lot of project management. Obviously, it was a big part of my first business, which is ClickUp, where I built project management systems like this alongside my partner. Uh, that was one of the reasons why we were able to grow and scale with such a lean team. Anywho, 
in general, there are two types of project management systems nowadays. There is a stage-based system, and then there's a subtask-based system. So let me break down how these work in just a second. Basically, there's stage-based or subtask-based. Stage-based systems are for situations where projects flow linearly through a queue. So let me give you an example from my actual business here. Projects start at the very top here and then work their way down to the very bottom. So essentially, they start at some sort of awaiting assignment or assign stage. Then, because they're articles, we will add them to a writing stage. Then after that, they'll move to an editing stage. Then they'll move to a ready for submission stage, and then they'll move to submitted. So let me just break these all down for you. In our case, uh, for writing, we start with assigned, then we go writing, then we go editing, we go ready for a submission, and then finally we have a submitted stage. In a nutshell, these are the stages that matter. I know I had a, a few more stages over there, but those are just tertiary stages for various little management things that don't ultimately apply to the stages that a project will flow through. Okay, so you can rename these to whatever the heck you want. I mean, like assigned could also just be like Q. Um, writing could be, I don't know, scoping. Editing could be, um, I don't know, building. Ready for submission could be QA. And then submitted could be delivered, right? Like these don't have to be the exact same words that I'm putting down here. But they tend to represent similar ideas. You have some sort of queue, which is flexible, that allows the person that you are assigning the project to to like manage their life and their day. You have some initial kind of rough draft thing. Then you have the actual thing itself. Then you usually have some sort of Q&A, and that's what our ready for submission stage is. And then ultimately you have some sort of stage that represents, hey, the task has now been delivered. Okay, so these are stage-based. These work really well for typically high volume applications where you have a lot of projects going through a queue. You have a big team, you need to be able to assign these things, and um, the projects themselves are relatively simple in nature. That is in direct contrast to what I'm calling subtask-based systems. Now, subtask-based systems look and work a little bit differently. So subtask-based systems are for situations where Scopes are complex, and projects can have multiple dependencies, let's say nonlinear dependencies. What nonlinear dependencies means in this case is it just doesn't always flow directly top to bottom through a queue. So let me show you an example with these. You'll see that there are multiple stages here, writing, editing, client delivery, for instance. This is a simplified example that I just wanted to show you guys that I'm using in this pipeline. But usually you, you kind of just use one or the other. If I go over to this project management system, which we are going to, let's do template creative agency. Okay, and what you'll see is in a system like this, which is like mailbox setup, instead of us just having a simple stage for each of the steps responsible for this task, launch instantly campaign. What we've done is we've broken all of these down into subtasks instead. And these are very similar conceptually to the statuses or stages that we had before, except now because they're subtasks, we can actually have people work on them simultaneously without actually needing to materially affect the stage that they're in. And then the stages themselves just turn into to do, working, or complete, or maybe like blocker or something. Okay, so quick example here, launch instantly campaign. Well, there are a bunch of steps that are involved here, but you don't have to do all the steps one after the other. You have to do some of these steps one after the other. Some of these have dependencies, but not all of them. For instance, you start by connecting domains to your workspace. Then you connect mailboxes to instantly. Then you warm up and configure mailboxes, complete SPF and DMARC, then you write the campaigns. Well, you could actually start writing the campaigns before you connect the domains to the workspace, right? So you could assign this to person A, and then you could assign this to person B, and you could actually have both of these tasks done simultaneously. Now, in our case, we've also added time estimates, due dates. There's some other information here as well, but you can add whatever fields you want in any sort of project management-based system, okay? Yeah, subtask-based systems tend to be much better for harder to scope, more variable things where you need to be able to jump in and just add an additional subtask for a system. You can imagine how that works really well or much better for automation systems than a stage-based sort of project management because in reality, if you're doing custom automations, the specific steps that you are going to have your team or yourself do are always going to depend on the scope. And the scope is usually going to be a little bit different from project to project, right? And because of the nonlinear dependency thing, you can actually start working on projects or multiple different parts of projects simultaneously without necessarily having to wait for everything. So that's more or less it. Uh, in terms of how to automate this, you basically just attach stage changes or subtask completions to webhooks. 
that are sent to make.com, which then trigger some sort of thing to occur in your workspace or maybe your Slack or your email. And there you have it. I hope these answers gave you some clarity on the challenges that you may or may not be facing with the AI and automation business. Here's the thing. This is just a small sample of the conversations that are happening all the time over on Daily Updates. So if you guys like this format and you guys want more direct answers to literally your question, I will eventually check that comment over there. Just leave one. I've never skipped a comment. Eventually I will get to it. Just head to the second link in the description. All you have to do is subscribe and then drop your question on any one of my videos. And I promise I will eventually address it. Thanks again for watching. Looking forward to catching you in the next one. Bye.